speaking in my name. Mr Speaker, over the past few weeks, this House has left no one in any doubt about what it does not want. It does not want to leave the EU without a deal, because that would hurt our economy and disrupt people's lives. It does not want to hold a general election, because it would waste time, increase division and solve none of the problems we face. Indeed, this House renewed its confidence in Her Majesty's Government a fortnight ago. Neither do I see anything approaching a majority across the House to hold a second referendum. And I, indeed, the leaders of the so-called People's Vote campaign obviously agree with me because they declined even to table an amendment to put this into effect. But I also accept that this House does not want the deal I put before it in the form that it currently exists. The vote was decisive, and I listened. So the world knows what this House does not want. Today, we need to send an emphatic message about what we do want. I believe that must include honouring the votes of our fellow citizens and completing the democratic process that began when this House voted overwhelmingly to hold the referendum, then voted to trigger Article 50, and which saw the vast majority of us elected on manifestos pledging to see Brexit through. I believe Oh. The uh, Prime Minister Vicky Nguyen, at the November European Council, she pleaded with other European leaders that her deal was not only the best deal, but the only possible deal, a statement she repeated time and time again, including in this House. We now hear from her spokespeople at number 10 that she wants to rip up the withdrawal agreement um, and open up the whole process again. Why would, she, why would people agree to that? Why would other European leaders agree to that? Yeah. Can I gently suggest to the Honourable Gentleman he actually listens to what I'm going to say in my speech before he asks questions of that sort? I believe that also means doing so, seeing Brexit through, means doing so by reaching an agreement, one that works for this country and our people and for the 27 nations of the European Union, including our nearest neighbour, Ireland. It means listening to the message being sent by the great manufacturing firms who employ millions of our constituents that they need an implementation period and a free trade area with our nearest market. It means protecting the security partnerships that keep us safe. It means caring about every part of this United Kingdom, including the people of Northern Ireland, who should be just as much the concern of each one of us in this Union Parliament as their fellow citizens in England, Scotland and Wales. A good deal that sets us on course for a bright future. That's what I believe this House wants. It is what this government wants, it is what I want, and it is what the British people want. And today we have the chance to show the European Union what it will take to get a deal through this House of Commons, what it will take to move beyond the confusion and division and uncertainty that now hangs over us and onto the bright, new, close, open relationship that we want to build and can build with our European friends in the years ahead. The way yeah. <laughs> the, the Prime Minister knows that her Treasury analysis shows that every single plan for Brexit makes us poorer. Yeah. So if she's confident of this plan, if she's confident, will she publish it? say to the Honourable Gentleman, we have, of course, published a document of economic analysis. We've published documents of other analysis as well. What, what those show was that the proposal that was put forward by the government was the best deal in terms of honouring the referendum and providing uh, protection for jobs and the economy in this country. Now, I know the Honourable Gentleman doesn't agree with that because he doesn't want to honour the referendum. I think it's our duty to honour that referendum. Um, the, I will give way one back. The Prime Minister for giving way. She has had very strong words against this House for not forming an alternative consensus, alternative to her deal. But she is now supporting the Brady Amendment tonight, so she will be voting against her own deal tonight. How does she expect this House to provide an alternative when she is voting against her own deal? time again, members on the opposition benches have stood up and asked me to listen to this House. Now I come to this House having listened to the House, and they say you shouldn't have done it. So the way, the way to make clear, the way to make clear what it will take 
to move to a situation where we can agree a deal is to reject the amendments that state and restate once again what we do not want and back instead the amendment that shows what this House needs in order to agree a deal. I give way to my honourable friend. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. She is absolutely right about uh, honouring the referendum result. Millions of people across the north of England voted in huge numbers to leave the European Union. Many of them went out and re-elected their Labour MPs on a solemn commitment to make good on the referendum. Is it not the case that if any Member of Parliament representing a Northern Leave constituency votes for Amendment B this evening, they will be voting to dishonour the referendum yeah. result? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I think he makes a very important point. It is up to every member of this House actually to remember the manifesto on which they were elected. Members, 80%, 80% of the votes cast at the general election were cast for parties that said they would honour the result of the referendum. And that's what we need to do. And we can honour honour the result of the referendum by showing tonight what it will take to enable this House to agree a deal on which we can leave the European Union. I give way to the right honourable gentleman. Mr for giving way. She now no longer favours the backstop arrangement that she negotiated and instead is in favour of alternative arrangements. Can she set out for, for the House what those alternative arrangements are? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he, he uh, references alternative arrangements as if this is something that has a phrase that has suddenly come into use. Of course, what we negotiate in the deal, the deal, and I'll come on to refer to this later on, does indeed allow for alternative arrangements. Uh, I would like to turn to a number. No, I would like to turn to a number. I would like to turn to a number of the amendments, and if I may, first turn to the amendment for my right honourable friend, the member for Meriden. And I appreciate the spirit of my right honourable friend's amendment because I too want to avoid leaving without a deal. And I've heard the concerns and anxieties of businesses and families around the country who worry about what would happen if we left without a deal. And I don't want to put at risk all the hard work that has seen this government deliver record high employment, the joint lowest unemployment in 45 years, and wages growing at their fastest rate in a decade. But my right honourable friend's amendment is missing the other half of the equation. For unless we are to end up with no Brexit at all, the only way to avoid no deal is to agree a deal. That is why I want to go back to Brussels with the clearest possible mandate to secure a deal that this House to secure a deal that this House can support. That means sending the clearest possible message, not about what this House doesn't. That means. That means sending the clearest possible message, not about what this House doesn't want, but what we do want. And Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker I'm just going to make a little more progress. I will, I'm always generous at taking interventions, as the Honourable Gentleman knows. I know that some members have been concerned that this debate could be the last chance to vote on their desire to avoid a no deal, so I want to reassure the House that it is not. We will bring a revised deal back to this House for a second meaningful vote as soon as we possibly can. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, if he he wants to comment on what I am saying about the process the Government will follow, I suggest he waits until I have completed what I am saying. Let me just very gently say to the Honourable Gentleman Member for Perth and North Perthshire and to his Honourable Friend the Member for Anhelion and Yar that both of them are very senior figures in the land as chairs of important select committees of the House and they should behave with a decorum that befits their high status. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. First of all, as I've said, we will bring a revised deal back to this House for a second meaningful vote as soon as we possibly can. And while we will want want the House to support that deal, if it did not, then just as before, we would table an amendable motion for debate the next day. Furthermore, if we have not brought a revised deal back to this House by Wednesday 13 February, we will make a statement and again table an amendable motion for debate the next day. So the House will have a further opportunity to revisit this question of leaving without a deal. Today, 
we can and must instead focus all our efforts on securing a good deal with the EU that enables us to leave in a smooth and orderly way on the 29th of March. I'll give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. She is, of course, right. There is more clarity about what this House doesn't want than to what it does want. But in order to get that clarity about what the House wants, why won't she agree to a series of indicative votes on all the substantive exactly. options before us, not the process, but the substance, including a comprehensive customs union? Yeah. 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 To the, the Honourable Lady, she and others, indeed her front bench, had the opportunity to table ah, indicative yeah. votes. Did they know they tabled something that said, well, well, what's the answer? Let's have a few more votes in the future, possibly, maybe, if we think it might be useful at some stage. This morning there's been some uh, kite flying about a so-called Tory Brexit compromise that would still take Scotland out of the EU and probably require an extension to Article 50 and proposes what has already been ruled out. Isn't that just further emphasise that this Prime Minister's Brexit policy has been about the Tory party, first, last, always. My, my Brexit policy and the policy of the Government has been about the vote that took place in 2016 in the referendum and delivering on leaving the European Union. I'd like now... I'd like now oh, wait. Thank my uh, rival friend for giving away on that particular point. Does she agree it's important that we honour the referendum, we honour the vote of 2016, and will she rule out any extension of Article 50 and any wrecking tactics from the party opposite yeah. and make sure we leave on the 29th of March? Yeah. Yeah. Honourable friend, I absolutely agree that we need to deliver on the result of the referendum. And I will also say to him that when people talk about things like delaying Article 50, actually that doesn't resolve the issue about what deal we should have in leaving the European Union. What we can do today is send a clear message to Brussels about what it is this House wants to see changing in the withdrawal agreement in order to be able to support it. I would like... Uh, I'll, I'll give way to the right honourable gentleman, then I will give, relent. Just on the, po on the point the Prime Minister was making, because I want to find out what has changed since she said to this House on the 14th of January, just, just a fortnight ago, she said some wanted to see changes to the withdrawal agreement, a unilateral exit mechanism from the backstop, an end date, or rejecting the backstop. The simple truth is that the EU was not prepared to agree to this, and rejecting the backstop means no deal. Does she still agree with herself? <laughs> Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, if he waits, I'm going to come on to talk about this issue around the backstop because we retain absolutely our commitment to have uh, a way of ensuring that we deliver on the commitment for no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. But he might have noticed uh, that actually we lost a vote and we've been listening to members across this House. We've been listening to members across this House. He, can't, you know, he and his honourable friend and right honourable friends say to me that I must recognise that we lost a vote. Yes, that's why we're here looking at what it will take to ensure we get a deal through this House. I said I would give way to the honourable gentleman. Very, very grateful to the Prime Minister, Minister for relenting. She's just about to rip up her backstop, and we're all just wishing she'd get on with it and just tell the South exactly what she plans to do. That involves an agreement with the that involves an uh, order. No, I know the members on the government benches find the honourable gentleman mildly provocative, but the honourable gentleman must. No, no. Yeah, 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 but he's not in an isolated category in that regard, but he must be heard. Pete Wishart. Mr Speaker, and I'll to continue to be mildly provocative, if I, if I can, by asking this question. This is an agreement with the European Union. Yes. What happens when the European Union say no to her again? Yes. First, of all, first of all, can I say to the honourable gentleman, the first step in all of this is for the House to make clear what it wants to see in relation to changes. And, and, uh, and he says that he wants me to get on and actually tell, talk about what I want to talk about. If he didn't, wasn't jumping up and down all the time trying to intervene, I might be able to actually get on with it. So, here we are. Mr Speaker, I'd now like to turn to the amendment from my right honourable and learned friend, the member for Beaconsfield, and the right honourable member for Normanton, Pontefract and Castleford. Now, I understand the concerns that have led to these amendments being tabled, but I have the most profound doubts about the consequences they would lead to. Both amendments seek to create and exploit mechanisms that allow Parliament to usurp the proper role of the Executive. 
Such actions would be unprecedented and could have far-reaching and long-term implications for the way the United Kingdom is governed and for the balance of powers and responsibilities in our democratic institutions. And I am sure that as former Ministers of the Crown, both of these right honourable members must know this. So while I do not question their sincerity in trying to avoid a no-deal Brexit, to seek to achieve this through such means is, I believe, deeply misguided and not a responsible course of action. Furthermore, neither amendment actually delivers on the best way of avoiding no deal, which is, as I have said, for this House to approve a deal with the European Union. In the case of my right honourable, I'll just make this, these points. In the case of my right honourable and learned friend, his amendment would see six full days given over to debates and votes on alternative plans, which we could have voted on today. And with just 59 days before we're due to leave the European Union, the way to deliver Brexit and avoid a no deal is to focus all our energies and time on getting a revised deal that both this House and the European Union can agree to support. Thank you, Mr Speaker. But does the Prime Minister not understand that the reason that we're in this mess is because she chose before to go to negotiate without first commanding the support of a majority of this House? And does she further understand that whether it's the option that's being put forward by her backbenchers or other options, she will need two things for that to succeed? Time and the opportunity for this House to agree on the negotiating mandate. Those amendments provide time and that opportunity. Why is she opposing them? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Honourable Gentleman has an opportunity today to agree the if you like, negotiating mandate for going back to Brussels by supporting the amendment in the name of my Honourable Friend, the Member for Altrincham and Sale. In the case of the Right Honourable Lady... In, sorry, I'm going to wait a moment. I'm most grateful to my Right Honourable Friend. She will have seen that the amendment which I have tabled goes solely to process, not to outcome. But isn't it the case that this House has never had a proper opportunity to debate options and to do it in a reasoned way? And what she's asking the House to do again today is to suddenly adopt a measure that the government has signed up to at the last moment and to say that that should be the route that we should take. Surely that illustrates the precise problem that this House has had throughout. And the purpose of my amendment, I make it clear to her, is to give the space to this House to find where the majority lies. And I would commend it to her. To my right honourable and learned friend, first of all, we have the opportunity today. I've, I and others have been listening and talking to members and right honourable members across this House, not the Leader of the Opposition, who didn't want to come and talk to me about these things, but we've been talking and listening to people about the issues that they have raised. I'm going to go on to mention a number of those issues later in my speech, but one of the issues which has been raised consistently by members is uh, about the backstop. Uh, we have an opportunity to give a clear message to the European Union on this matter today. And I will also say to my right honourable and learned friend that I am sure he has thought through very carefully the longer term implications of the sort of move that, the moves that are being proposed uh, uh, tonight in these, uh, uh, the amendments that he and the right honourable lady, the member for Normanton, have put forward, and the implications they have for the relationship between the Executive and Parliament in the future. I'd like to come on to the right honourable ladies. I'd like to come. I will give way once, once more and then to the honourable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister. Does the Prime Minister also get uh, the idea that the European Union too wants to do a deal with the United Kingdom, that we have a £95 billion deficit with them, that the Germans sell us 850,000 cars every year, we buy 20% of all the Prosecco produced in Italy. Does she, does she agree with me that the European Union wish to carry on trading with the United Kingdom in, current, in the way that they currently do? to my right honourable friend, and I'm going to reference this later on. I think there is a willingness on the other side in, in terms of the European Union to agree a deal with the United Kingdom, but what they clearly said when the meaningful vote was lost, they wanted to know what it was the UK wanted to see happening in relation to the deal. That's an opportunity that we have today. I will give way to the honourable lady and then I'll make some progress. Um, thank, you very much indeed. thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. I'm very grateful to the Prime Minister to allow me to intervene at this early stage. Um, the Prime Minister is trying to encourage this House to vote for an amendment which uses the words alternative arrangements. 
to avoid a hard border on the island of Ireland. Forgive me, Prime Minister, if I say that those words are nebulous. <laughs> they are nebulous. The Prime Minister has a duty to spell out to this House before we vote what those arrangements, alternative arrangements are and how on earth, how on earth the other 27 EU member states are expected to agree to this revised arrangement before Brexit date on the 29th of March. The Honourable Lady. Obviously, the amendment is standing in the name of my Honourable Friend, the Member for Orchingham and Sayre West, and other Honourable and Right Honourable Members, does indeed reference all the issue of alternative arrangements. That term is actually one which is recognised in the um, withdrawal agreement and the political declaration in terms of yield. And the, if I'm going on, if she will forgive me, I'm going on to reference a number of ways in which uh, uh, a number of options that have been brought forward in relation to that particular term. But the, the no, I'm going to make some progress. I'm going to make some progress. Uh, as in the case of the amendment of, in the name of the Right Honourable Lady, the member for Normanton, uh, Pontefract and Castleford, her amendment does not rule out no deal. It simply delays the point of decision. And the policy dilemmas, the choices, the trade-offs that we face as a Parliament will not go away if we postpone exit day. Her amendment offers absolutely, just in, her amendment offers absolutely no positive suggestions to address them. Furthermore, I believe that the EU are very unlikely to agree to extend Article 50 without a credible plan for how we are going to approve a deal. So whatever the Right Honourable Lady's intention, I think the practical consequences of her amendment would not be to rule out no deal, but to delay Brexit. And that's not a course of action that this House should support. I will, of course, give way to the Right Honourable Lady. If the Prime Minister does not get agreement, either from the EU or from this Parliament, to her next course of action, is she ruling out any extension of Article 50? Mm. I, have, I have been very clear, and I have said earlier, the process that we will follow. If we, don't get it, if we get a deal and we bring it back to this House, or if we haven't got a deal, we will give this House opportunities, through amendable motions, to state their view as to what should happen at that point in time. I will give way to my honourable friend. I am very grateful uh, to my right honourable friend for giving way. Would she agree with me that throughout the history of the European Union, they have always worked to deadlines, yeah. Yeah. and the British yes. people yeah. now want us to get on and finish yeah. the job they have given us. Yeah. 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 I, can I thank my, my honourable friend for uh, what he's pointed out, and particularly for the fact that, as he said, I think the British people actually just want to see this done. Yeah. They want us to leave. They want us to leave with a deal. I am going to make. Um, I will give way to the right honourable lady as I have referenced her. I think it is really important that the House has some clarity on this. If she is saying that there will be future votes in which Parliament can make some decisions about no deal or not, she will know that the credibility that she has is very limited because she said there would be a vote in December and then pulled it at the last minute. So therefore we do need some clarity from her now. Is she saying that if Parliament votes for an extension of Article 50 to avoid no deal on March the 29th, she would respect it? Yeah. Yeah. To the Right Honourable Lady, there is a very simple point. Extending Article 50 does not rule out no deal. No, this is... I'm sorry. This is, this is, this is, there are, as I've said before, but I'm, I apologise to the House, I'm going to repeat again. There are two ways in which it is possible to rule out no deal. One is by, not re, by revoking Article 50 and not leaving. That's the SNP's view, but it's not the view I believe. It's not my view, it's not the government's view, it's not the view of the British people, and I, I believe it's not the view of the majority of members of this House. The other way to ensure we don't leave with no deal is to agree a deal. Now, the stage we're at at the moment is that the House of Commons has rejected the deal that the government agreed with the European Union when we brought that back. It rejected it having, as having uh, achieved further reassurances. I'm going to go on to say what I believe is now required by this House uh, uh, and uh, from the conversations and discussions that I've had with members and, honourable, with members and right honourable members of this House. Uh, and as I have set out, and uh, the Right Honourable Lady wants to intervene again, I will, allow, I will take her intervention again, and then, if she will excuse me, I will make some progress. 
I, I am very grateful for the Prime Minister in uh, giving way again, but I'm simply trying to understand what she is saying, because she can't have it both ways. She can't be saying that she absolutely will leave on March the 29th in all circumstances, whatever happens, and then simultaneously say there will be an opportunity for Parliament to have some future votes and decide what happens next if there is no deal. The question here is whether or not she would ever contemplate any extension of Article 50 to get a bit more time to sort things out to avoid no deal. Yes or no? As I, as I said earlier in my speech, we will bring a revised deal back to this House for a second meaningful vote as soon as we possibly can. If it was not supported by the House, then we would table an amendable motion for debate the next day. And if we have not brought a revised deal back to this House by Wednesday, the 13th of February, we will make a statement and again table an amendable motion for debate the next day. And the Right Honourable Lady references the timetable up to the 29th of March. Actually, this House voted for that timetable when it voted to trigger Article 50. Now, I'd like to move on to uh, the amendment in the name of the Leader of the Opposition. Because we no, I'm going to I'm going to make some progress. No. Mr Speaker, we should not indulge the amendment from the Leader of the Opposition. First he wanted a comprehensive customs union, then it was a new customs union, now it's a permanent customs union. Now, Last week I asked him whether he means accepting the common external tariff, accepting the common commercial policy, accepting the Union Customs Code or accepting EU state aid rules. He had no answers then, he has no answers now, he hasn't got a clue. He still he is still facing both ways. He is still facing both ways on whether Labour would keep freedom of movement. And last night he whipped his MPs to oppose the bill that would end free movement and introduce a skills-based system. And he is still facing both ways on a second referendum. His amendment calls for legislation for a public vote, but we still don't know whether he would use it or what the question would be. And I know that many Labour voters and MPs and others in the Labour movement are frustrated by the Leader of the Opposition's approach. It is it's surely time for him to step up to the responsibility of being Leader of the Opposition. And finally, and finally sit down with me and talk about how we can secure support in this House for a deal. As I said last week, he's been willing to sit down with Hamas, Hezbollah and the IRA without preconditions. It's time he did something in our national interest, not against it. Mr. No, I'm going to make this. Mr Speaker, none of the amendments I've addressed so far will ensure that we deliver Brexit. Instead, they simply provide more arguments against action and more reasons to stand still. Rather than setting out a plan to make Brexit work, they create further delay. And delay without a plan is not a solution, it's a road to nowhere. But I'm not prepared. No, I have said to the Honourable Lady that I'm going to make progress. I am not prepared. I am not prepared to stand still and put at risk either the Brexit the people of this country voted for or the economic success the people of this country have worked so hard to secure. And after this House gave no I'm going to after this House gave its verdict on the withdrawal agreement, I stood at this dispatch box and pledged to work with the House to determine what steps to take next. And in the two weeks since I've done just I have done just that. I've listened. Oh, well, the Labour Party front bench says, no, I haven't done that. Actually, the only people I haven't been able to talk to about this is the Labour Party front bench, because they decide not to, not to come. So I've listened to the House. I've met with MPs from all parties, spoken with and listened to MEPs, heads of the devolved administrations, senior trade unionists and the leaders of Britain's biggest businesses. And from those conversations, it's obvious that three key changes are needed. First, we must be more flexible, open and inclusive in how we engage this House in our approach to negotiating our future partnership with the European Union. Second, we must and will embed the strongest possible protections on workers' rights and the environment. And the Government will not allow the UK leaving the EU to result in any lowering of standards in relation to employment, environmental protection or health and safety. 
And furthermore, we will ensure that after exit day, the House has the opportunity to consider any measure approved by EU institutions that strengthens any of these protections. As I've set out before, we will consider legislation where necessary to ensure these commitments are binding. And to this end, we're having further talks with the trade unions and MPs across the House in the coming days to flesh out exactly how we can ensure that their concerns on these fronts are met. And so my message to Britain's workers in factories, offices, warehouses and right across our country is that you can rest assured that the government will deliver for you. I thank the Prime Minister for giving way. There is a need to give a clear and concise message to the EU and to our nation. The Prime Minister doesn't want a no deal. The businesses in Slough and in the rest of the country do not want a no deal. The unions which she just mentioned do not want a no deal. So what is the problem in putting that down in black and white? Prime Minister. In order to deliver what the Honourable Gentleman wants and ensure we, leave, we don't leave with no deal, we need to agree a deal. What we are doing today is looking at a series of amendments, and I'm coming on shortly to an amendment that actually sets out a clear view from this House, that we can take to the European Union and work to ensure that we can leave with a deal. And this is the third, no, this is the third point that has become clear from these discussions. We must address the concerns of this House over the nature of the Northern Ireland backstop. The fundamental concern is that what is supposed to be a temporary arrangement could in fact become permanent, and the message has been unequivocal that this House wants changes to the backstop before it will back a deal. This message, no, I'm, I'm going to explain this position that uh, people have put forward. That, that message has come from Conservative backbenchers, from opposition members and from our confidence and supply partners in the DUP. That is why I believe it is in all our interests for the House to back the amendment tabled by my honourable friend, the member for Orchingham and Sale West, and the member for South West Wiltshire, and my right honourable friend, the member for Ashford and others. This amendment, oh, I'm going to explain this. This amendment will give the mandate I need to negotiate with Brussels an arrangement that commands a majority in this House. One that ensures we leave with a deal and addresses the House's concerns while guaranteeing no return to the hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. What I'm talking about is not a further exchange of letters, but a significant and legally binding change to the withdrawal agreement. <laughs> negotiating, negotiating such a change will not be easy. It will involve reopening the withdrawal agreement, a move for which I know there is limited appetite among our European partners. <clears throat> But I believe that with a mandate from this House and supported by the Attorney General, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, I can secure such a change in advance of our departure from the EU. So we, I give way to the Right Honourable Gentleman. I am very grateful to the Prime Minister for, for giving way. And can I welcome what she has said about the need to address the issue of the Northern Ireland backstop? She is quite right to emphasise that as the primary problem. And I welcome the fact that she has said in terms that she will go back and seek the reopening of the withdrawal agreement. And she can be assured of our support in trying to find a solution which avoids any hard border on the island of Ireland, but also avoids any borders within the United Kingdom. Right, Honourable Gentleman, I'm grateful for the clarity with which he's just set out that position. We remain absolutely committed as a government to ensuring we have no hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland, and also ensuring that any proposals that do uh, get accepted by this House and put forward are ones that maintain our precious union. Now, I'm going to. We will, I'll give my. I thank the Prime Minister very much indeed for giving way. I agree with her that the best way to avoid a no deal is to put an agreement in place. And she'll be aware that on these benches some very, for some very surprising uh, members with diff very different Brexit views have been coming together to come up with some proposals. We're very grateful for the time that she's engaged with us. Will she undertake to uh, ask her officials now to take forward these proposals, to consider them seriously and to put them on the table as a way perhaps of fleshing out these alternative arrangements that she is talking about. Yeah. Prime Minister. In fact, um, uh, my uh, right honourable friend actually anticipated what I was going to go on to, uh, to, to speak about in her question. But I can just say this, first of all, that what we'll be focusing on is delivering specific changes that will address the concerns of the House. And I'm looking at a range of way, ways 
to achieve this. And as my right honourable friend has just uh, referenced, she and my honourable friends, the members for Wickham, North West Hampshire, and North East Somerset, and others, have worked to bring forward a serious proposal that we are engaging with sincerely and positively. And I give. No, I, I give. I, I give. Just a moment. I will. I will take some more interventions. But just a moment, and uh, I can give my honourable friend the confirmation that we will sit down and work through, in the way that she has suggested, the proposal that has come forward. I give way to the honourable lady. Seventeen point four million people voted for Brexit. The idea that they were duped into doing so is absolute nonsense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Brexit. But it must be a Brexit that protects jobs in my constituency and beyond. And unions and bosses tell me that that requires a permanent customs union or arrangement. Why won't you listen on that? Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Lady, she's absolutely right about ensuring that we deliver on the vote of those 17.4 million people. And I want to deliver on that with a deal that does protect jobs. And what we need to ensure is that as we look to the future relationship, we have the, uh, uh, in that free trade area and in the customs arrangements we have, that we, rec- we remember the necessity of ensuring that we protect those jobs. What I've also heard very clearly from honourable members on all sides of this House and, of course, from the trade union leaders that I've spoken to <laughs> is this issue about ensuring that we protect workers' rights, and as I've just indicated, we are committed to doing so. Can I say, can I, can I, I've taken, no? Can I say to all members of this House, I have already been very generous in taking interventions. I am sure there are many members of this House who wish to contribute to this debate, and so I will make progress. I will. I, I, can I say to my honourable friend, the member for North East Somerset, as I have just referenced him in my speech, I will give way to him. My honourable friend, and may I thank her for her very clear assurances that the withdrawal agreement text will be reopened, that she will be considering what has been called the Malthouse Compromise. Yeah. And can I, may I ask for one more um, promise that any further detailed agreement will come back and will not be deemed to have been ratified uh, by the amendment by my right honourable friend, the member for Altrincham and Sale West. Can I, can I give Prime my Minister. assurance? It, ha- it does have to come back. It will come back to this House. It has to come back to this House. Uh, and legally, ratification, ratification of the agreement can only actually take place. Uh, it is the act of passing the WAB, the, the bill, that will uh, be the ratification moment for any arrangements. I will take one more intervention from the Honourable Lady on the back. For giving way. Um, she has repeatedly referred to protecting workers' rights post Brexit. Can I take her back to 2017 and my bill that was specifically about protecting workers' rights when we leave the European Union? Uh, on the 29th of March. Uh, can I ask her why it wasn't adopted then, uh, and if she's so committed to it, will she meet with me to discuss the elements of that bill that she's prepared to adopt going forward? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Yes, to the Honourable Lady, we are looking at ways in which we can give that assurance in relation to uh, 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 workers' rights. And, as I said, we are uh, looking at where uh, legislation would be appropriate, where legislation would be necessary. I'm happy to meet with her and go through that, uh, and go through that issue. Um, can, I, can I say, I just, if I may, I've taken a lot more intervention. I wanted just to reference also, to complete what I was saying to my right honourable friend, the member for Loughborough, that we will indeed um, engage seriously and positively with the proposals that she has put forward, which were almost referenced by, also referenced by my honourable friend, the member for North East Somerset. Um, the uh, amendment that we, uh, the, the concept that we see within that, crucially, is this concept of alternative arrangements, which has, as I've already said in this speech, uh, has already been accepted by the EU as a way out of the backstop. And so, therefore, I commend uh, them for their, I commend my honourable friends for their, and right honourable friends for their willingness to find a solution. And I look forward to working with them over the coming days. But a number of other colleagues have also suggested ways to achieve this aim such as securing a time limit to the backstop or a unilateral exit clause, which, of course, we will study closely as well. While there are obviously details that need to be worked through, while there are obviously details that need to be worked through, the fact that leading figures from different sides of the argument are coming together to develop proposals shows how much progress have been, has been made over the past few weeks. I will give way to the leader of the Green Party. 
I'm very grateful to her for, for, for giving way, but does she recognise that there is no solution in chasing in fantasies? The EU has ruled this kind of option out many times, and you cannot have you cannot have an insurance policy that is based on a technology that doesn't exist. Will she not recognise that what she is chasing here are heated up fantasies that have already been rejected by the EU and they depend on technologies that don't exist? There are members across this House who have put forward a number of proposals as to how this issue can be addressed. They are not they are not uh, indulging in fantasies. They are coming forward with serious proposals which this government will work with them on. Uh, the essence of... Uh, <laughs> As to the question of our control over our laws and to honour the referendum, will my right honourable friend give instructions to make certain that in any future withdrawal and implementation bill there will be an express repeal of the 1972 Act so as to dovetail with Section 1 of the Withdrawal Act 2018 we've already passed. Minister. Can I say to my honourable friend that, uh, obviously as he knows, in the EU Withdrawal Act we repealed the 72 European Communities Act. Uh, for the purposes of the implementation period it would be necessary to replicate the, the uh, uh, impact of some of those aspects of that Act, um, but I will certainly take what my honourable friend has said, and uh, uh, within the uh, WAB, within the withdrawal agreement bill that we will need to bring forward to this House, we will make absolutely clear the arrangements for ensuring that, that act, the European Communities Act and the impact of it does not uh, uh, go further beyond the end of that uh, implementation period. Um, I, if if, if honourable... If honourable members will just excuse me for a minute, I will take some more interventions. I will take some more interventions in the future. I will take some more interventions in a little while. But if I can just make the point that the essence of any negotiation is to find a mutually acceptable solution, and that's the spirit in which both sides have consistently approached these negotiations, and that is the spirit in which I will engage with our partners if this amendment passes. And some say that there's no point, I think some I'm hearing that from some of the uh, interventions from a sedentary position and elsewhere, some say there's no point even trying to achieve any change and that the EU simply won't budge under any circumstances. But in the two years since this House voted to trigger Article 50, the EU has made concessions in many areas of the negotiations where people said no ground would ever be given. And today neither side in this negotiation wants to see the UK leave without a deal. The simple fact is that the deal I reached with the EU has been rejected by this House. In response, the EU has asked us what we do want, what this Parliament will accept, and this is Parliament's opportunity to tell them. I give way to the Honourable Member. Has the Prime Minister agreed that rather than chasing a fantasy, there is now actually an opportunity, and an opportunity which has been presented by Michel Barnier himself when he told the Irish Government that the EU would look for ways of ensuring that checks and balances or checks could be take place without How? any infrastructure along the, yeah, the, the border and, no, even, no. and even talked about paperless and decentralised right. arrangements. Yeah, yeah, That's what the yeah, EU are yeah. saying. So obviously it's not a fantasy, it's something which we have in common. Yes. And, Prime Minister. And these are issues exactly which we want to work on and a number of proposals that have been put forward. But what matters today is that Parliament makes it clear to the European Union that this issue of the backstop is the one that needs to be dealt with. This is Parliament's opportunity to respond to the European Union, who have, con have said that they want us to tell us what we want, and this is our opportunity to tell them. This is, not, this is not the second meaningful vote. As I've said and repeated, we will bring a revised deal back to this House for just such a vote as soon as possible. But a vote for this amendment is a vote to tell Brussels that the current nature of the backstop is the key reason the House cannot support this deal, just as many honourable members have said to me, to the media and to their constituents over the past few weeks. A vote against this amendment does the opposite. It tells the EU that despite what people may have said in speeches, tweets and newspaper columns, the backstop is not the problem. And it risks sending a message that we are not serious about delivering a Brexit that works for Britain. I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to her for giving way. She's not the first Prime Minister to discover that the Conservative Party is utterly ununitable and unleadable on Europe. Many, many. 
many, many other Prime Ministers have, have learnt that lesson. But as she celebrates the fact that she, she has people on different sides of the argument coming together in support of an amendment, doesn't she realise it's because the amendment is so nebulous as to be meaningless that she's been able to get them to agree to it? Prime Minister! I think if he wants to uh, look for different views around this issue, he can perhaps talk to some of his honourable colleagues, <laughs> as we've been hearing from the... And, um, and he, might actually, he might actually try to get the leader of the opposition to focus on, an, on a detailed proposal for what the Labour Party thinks for the future. No, I'm not going to take... I'm going to go, oh, I, I promised my honourable friend I would give way to him. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. I think on this side of the House we're all looking to try and find a way to get a deal. And I've been very impressed with what the Prime Minister said today. But can, can she assure the House that we will send the Prime Minister back to Brussels to reopen a withdrawal agreement? But if she comes back and we don't agree with it, we will still have the right to vote against it. Prime Minister! Yes, of course. This House will have the right to decide whether or not it agrees the uh, uh, agreement that's, uh, that's come forward. But can I, can I, can I say, I hope, I hope my honourable friend when we do, as I'm sure that we will be able to, bring a revised agreement back to this House, I hope my honourable friend will look at that carefully before he determines where, where his vote should go. No, I'm now, I am going to, I'm conscious of the length of time I've been on, at the dispatch box. Honourable members want to speak. I'm now going to uh, conclude. Mr Speaker, since the draft withdrawal agreement was published, I've come to the House to discuss it more than half a dozen times. I've been on the front bench for many hours of debate, taking hundreds of questions and interventions from honourable and right honourable members, and I've been listening. I've witnessed, I've witnessed, I've witnessed division and discord. Um, can I say to my honourable friend, I had indicated I wasn't going to be taking any more interventions, and I'm just com completing my speech. But I'm sure she'll have an opportunity, if she catches the Speaker's eye, to, to speak later. I've, I've witnessed division and discord, and I've seen passion and anger on all sides. But in the two weeks since the House rejected the withdrawal agreement, I've sensed a growing recognition of the task that has been entrusted to us. Members on all sides have begun to focus on what really matters on delivering the Brexit that Britain voted for while protecting our economy and our people. We can increasingly see where this consensus lies, and I believe that we are within reach of a deal that this House can stand behind. But the days ahead are crucial. When I go back to Brussels to seek the changes this House demands, I need the strongest possible support behind me. Most of the amendments before us do not provide that. They create a cacophony of voices when this House needs to speak as one. I will never stop battling for Britain, but the odds of success become far longer if this House ties one hand behind my back. So I call on the House to give me the mandate I need to deliver a deal this House can support. Do that, and I can work to reopen the withdrawal agreement. Do that, and I can fight for a backstop that honours our commitments to the people of Northern Ireland in a way this House can support. Do that, and we can leave the EU with a deal that honours the result of the referendum. So the time has come for words to be matched by deeds. If you want to tell Brussels what this House will accept, you have to vote for it. If you want to leave with a deal, you have to vote for it. If you want Brexit, you have to vote for Brexit. Yeah.